try to adopt DD within our, an organization, you might uh, encounter some oh, sorry. Yeah, you might encounter some problems. Uh, the main problem is that you don't have buy-in from the rest of the company, and this might be a problem because if you try to go by yourself, you might crash along, along the way. So, in my experience, there are several reasons why you don't have buy-in of the organization. But the, the, the first of all, it's that DDD is not a good approach for the domain that you are tackling. So let's say that you're, you have a very easy uh, domain. Let's say that your company has a product that's uh, data-driven. You have a crude API. That's it. No logic behind that. So it's DDD suitable for that? Well, probably not. You don't have to go over engineer anything. You have to focus on doing simple stuff. But what about if you have a real complex domain and you still don't have buy-in from your organization after trying to explain the benefits of DD and this uh, enabling an ubiquitous language and, and so forth? Well, usually it's because people don't understand, because we don't uh, explain ourselves correctly. That happened to me a couple of times. And you get fear. So you explain something and the feedback is fear. And that's because people fear the unknown, or fear the, what they don't understand. And it's a very natural reaction that happens to me every day. And sometimes when we experience that feedback with, with fear, we say, okay, uh, they, they are not understanding, or they are not putting effort to understand me, so I am going to go by myself. So I've seen a couple of times just a, a CTO or a technical guy saying, okay, this is great, I tried it with business people, but they said no. So, never mind. Like DDD, let's go to the tactical patterns and let's develop. And that's perfectly okay, but that's not DDD. Well, and this can be arguable. You can find me outside if you want to talk about this later. But for me, the most important part of DDD is not the tactical patterns. So you can have an an, uh, <clears throat> any kind of architecture without having the strategic patterns of DDD. But if you don't have the strategic patterns of DED, you're missing all this knowledge crunching that you have when you are just going fully DD, as I like to say. So just remember that DED is about collaboration. It's about uh, knowledge crunching. It's about bringing people together. So uh, you're, you're more rich if you have business people talking to developers, and if you also have developers talking to business people. So it's a two-way street. So, why is this good for an organization? Uh, well, usually, if you have the same way of thinking, you have the same results. And when people struggle and say, hey, what happens? I, I'm trying to do things the same way, and I'm having the same results. This is totally unexpected. You say, well, maybe, but maybe you have to just change a little bit your mindset. And when talking about DDD, and again, in my experience, when you go to usually a business person, a CEO, for example, and you talk about DED, you need him to enable a mindset revamp throughout the whole organization, because this is what it's all about. We have to change how we think. We have to change how we do stuff. And asking people to commit to a change is probably the most uh, difficult thing that a, an organization can face. It's really, really hard. It's not changing an individual mindset. It's changing how the whole company thinks about business. I'm not talking about development here. It's whole business. So let me talk you, uh, sorry, tell you a short story. Uh, I'm going to present the cast first. Whoops. So that's me, several years ago, doing fancy stuff, like Java coding at the time, I think. And I was on... Uh, a former customer of mine, an insurance company that belonged to a bigger insurance company that belonged to a bank. So uh, they called me and they say, uh, we have this idea, we're going to, we want to go fully online. And at the moment, it was a disruptive idea, in, at least in Spain. So as he said, they came, big bank, big insurance company, they set up a spin-off startup, small insurance company. But they got, they got all the resources from the, uh, the group, the, the other company's group. So 
basically they they wanted to convert from their I think they had a six percent conversion rate for uh, just uh, customers that uh, actually uh, had their uh, insurance plans without any assistance, and they wanted to go for 60% within a year. So it was quite ambitious. And again, this was the first time what was going to happen, and they've been trying to, to go for it for, for a couple of months. And this, the problem is that they were struggling a lot. They, they came from this corporate environment, they had a lot of just, I'm going to say, non-agile way of thinking. It's not that agile is better, but in this case, uh, it was super bureaucracy, uh, it, was, it was a real mess. And also, uh, there were no talking among people. It's just, here's your requirements, go and do it, come back, we'll give you more when you're, we're done. So, there was a good thing about this company, is that business had a very clear idea of what they wanted to, to uh, get to the market. Or at least they claimed so. So I say, okay, it's okay. And from a technical point of view, the tactical patterns of DED seem to fit really nice. So I say, hey, this looks promising. Why not? I'm most, mostly free now, so let's go to, to make this happen. So I started there, and a couple of weeks uh, later, I, some, I somehow felt that something were, was not going okay. First of all, I didn't see any business people around, ever. It was a bunch of developers, and I was asking, hey, where's, where's business? I mean, you are 20 people, and half is development, where's the other? No, they don't come around. They are in their offices, in, just in the, in, in the old building. Well, okay, that's all right. And you, you saw everybody frustrated. Uh, it was a real pain to go to the office every day. I, it was like, man, but you're doing something cool. You're bringing an old-fashioned uh, uh, way of working to something really new that haven't been done yet. So after talking to people, I figured out that, first of all, uh, when business asked something to developers and developers shipped a feature, business came back with, a, hey, this is wrong. This is not what you wanted. You are not doing a, a good work. And the developer said, hey, we crafted the most advanced and elegant solution for the business requirements. So you, you can see the friction there, because this happened with every and every, all, all, of the, all of the features were having the same result. Plus, you were saying, like, when, when they went to the cafeteria, yes, developers avoided marketeers. It was like, and it was like, man, you're working together, or you're supposed to work together. So, basically, this is what we had. So this didn't look as promising as I anticipated. So, the thing is that the general attitude was very negative, uh, people working silos, no collaboration. So, I started to feel a bit overwhelmed. So, okay, how can I change the situation around? And I, I started thinking about previous experiences. So, more or less at the time, I was working with other startups, and my job with them was just to advise them technically on their business model. So they came to me, they explained what the, what the business was, they get a rough estimate of how much would it cost, and then they got that estimate and go to investors. That's it, pretty easy. Thing is that when you have this requirement gathering of startups that are in, in early stage, you need a tool set, you need something to get that working. So one of my customers introduced me to the business model canvas. So it's not fancy, it's a piece of, piece of paper with some blocks there. The good thing is that after using it for the first time, I had this customer say, hey, let's use this, and I fell in love with the business model canvas, not the customer. So, what this does is, uh, well, first of all, it's a framework uh, embedded by Alexander Osterwalder, I think it's pronounced like that, uh, that allows you to uh, create, deliver, and capture value. So that's the only thing it does. And the goal 
is to define strategic initiatives of the business. So basically, this framework allows you to have a 30,000 feet view of what a business does, a okay, business model. So I started using it consistently with all the startups I work with. Most of them are still using it. But I found out that just uh, companies as an espresso are using it in the day-to-day -day work. So I, so I, I thought for myself, well, this is not something that I'm, that, that's not in the market, it's there. So, well, let's, let's try it. So let me go super quickly on, on what's this. So first of all, we have the value propositions. That's the what. What do we do? What does my company do? Actually, what are we paid for? For who are we doing what we're doing? So it's our customer segments. We can have multiple, we have one. Next is how do we do what we do? Do we need any resources to do that? With what are we going to do this? If we need help, do we need any third parties to help us? So our key partners? And I'm going to skip these two blocks here. Uh, I have a work, uh, hand on session tomorrow if you're interested. I will go a bit deeper on this. So when you have this, oops, man, sorry. So when you have all this, then you, you can calculate the costs. How much is this going to cost me? And of course, hey, show me the money. I'm going to receive any money. Remember that we are doing something to get money. That's the only objective of companies. Okay? Why this, is, this tool or this framework is, is cool? Because you have the what? the cost and the revenue. When you are a developer, you have the what. If you are lucky, you have the who. But usually developers are not aware about the money, nor the cost. So for me, when, when I was talking to customers, I was, was thinking about the 30,000 uh, 30 30, feet uh, view of the company. So here you have all the pieces that you need to <coughs> create, deliver, and capture value. So from a development point, software developer point of view, what this uh, framework allows you to do, first of all, understand the business. Just have a, 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 big, a better understanding of what your company is doing. So you're not a software developer, that, what do you do? Oh, I develop, and your company? You know, I just develop. We need to be more aware of the environment where we are. Remember that uh, a service is not a product, and software is not a product. It has a lot of things around. You have marketing, you have sales, you have all of other stuff that you need to take into account. From a software development point of view, you also need to learn to speak business language. And why is this? Because I come from, from a lot of companies where developers say, hey, why don't business people come to talk to us? And it's like, well, because we talk strange. We, are, we have this way of thinking, super structured, and we are super comfortable, and we have a lot of developers around, and we're comfortable talking to each other. But then you have these business people, it's like my grandma. Hey, what do you do for work? Oh, I do computer things. Oh, okay, that's it. That's only the only conversation I can have. So if you learn how to speak business, you will be able to step into business people's shoes and feel the pain. They also have pain. So, Usually, from a developer, uh, developer point of view, we say, oh, look at this pressure they are putting on me. Don't they see this is complex for me? This is not easy. I have to invest, I have to learn, I have to experiment. But from a, from a development point of view, and I am, how many times do we think about that in mar marketeers? You know, marketeers are the guys with a tie that are there, that are just getting reports out of analytics having coffee, man, we have to be a bit humble and just think that their work is as difficult as our work. I couldn't do marketing work, well, not today, I have to learn it, but that requires time. So let's say that, for me at least, the business model canvas allowed me to, to do all this stuff. And here I have an important question. Hey, this is, you're telling about the business model canvas is super interesting, but 
what does it have to do with domain-driven design? And it's a good question. Uh, well, basically, the business model canvas defines strategic initiatives of the business, and domain-driven design addresses those strategic initiatives. So we have a way to define them, and we have a way to address them. So for me, it's a, a good tool to fill in the gap that we have there. So I'm going to go back to my story. Uh, we had a lot of frustration uh, between all the team in this company. Uh, we had misalignment between people, and the tactical patterns uh, were, was OK. So I also had the business model canvas available, but I was not comfortable, because uh, I wanted to apply a new philosophy with, uh, with a new tool. So I, I was struggling a bit, so I, go, I went to my partner at the time. I told him, OK, I have a plan, just master plan to just have a success in this project. What I'm going to do is go to the CEO's office and tell him, you know, we're going to apply a new uh, philosophy with a new tool that your developers don't know, and just trust me, everything is going to go fine. So my partner was like, looking at me like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, can you just wait for a second and think about the reaction of the CEO? Yeah, pretty much. Every time, in my experience with the CEO, we took a new idea. This was the solution. This, the same gestures. No, 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 no way, no way. Don't tell me about it. So we need to enable this uh, collaboration between people. We have uh, a very uh, difficult problem, uh, them versus us problem. So my partner gave me the key to solve this problem. And he said, OK, if you go there and just explain them their problems, they are going to just run away from you. So you have to find a way to figure out how to tell them their problems so that they can realize for, by themselves. And then they will just open and listen to you. And I say, OK, nice. And how can I do that? Say, he said, I don't know. But that's what you have to do. I say, OK. So after a bit of conversation, he told me, OK, why don't you go Black Ops there? I said, well, Black Ops? Yeah, just tell them you're going to lie to them. Tell them you're going to do something and do other thing. They say, OK, I can try. I only can be fired, so let's go for it. So. Uh, can, how can we get people to listen to us? Because first of all, I needed to get the attention from upper management. And I came across uh, a paper uh, from Gardner. Uh, Gardner is a business analyst company. They, uh, they manufacture uh, vendor briefings. And it appears that for, for business people, being refer uh, referred in Gardner is super important. I'm not sure why, because it's like a, a leaflet with some fancy graphs. But I mean, my CEO loves it. My company is almost going to be referenced there, and everybody's happy. So the thing is, this paper said the business model canvas is a powerful tool that helps CEOs quickly grasp how business grow without getting in operational details. So I got there and said, hey, can you read this paper? And I'm going to use this tool to just try things out. And he said, oh, this is perfect. If Gardner says it's good, let's go for it. I said, yeah, OK, first thing is there. And I had to figure out to do the same to get developers' attention. And in order to do that, I heard this at the office. The ego of software developers is the best tool to challenge them. And as a software developer, I feel totally identified with this. So. I went to talk to developers, and I said, hey, you know, there is a fancy tool that we can use to work out things with people. Ah, don't worry. No, you, you're not going to understand it. So I get this, no? Yeah, we're going to do it. And they started to listen up. So I decided to run a sneaky experiment. And what I did was get a business model canvas, went to the CEO's office, and said, OK, Let's stay in this room until I have a clear idea of what your business is about. And we were there for a couple of days. Or we went home to sleep and came back. But we spent a lot of hours just defining business, putting things down there. 
Then I thanked him, I went off, and I did the same with developers. The thing is, the developers said, wait, we don't know about the business. I said, okay, don't worry. Just put there what, you, what the software is doing. Because that's the, the most exact thing that you have for what the business is doing. And I said, okay, let's do it. And I went away, and after a couple of days, I came back. And I tell the CEO, okay, look, I think I missed something because I, I tried to re re replay all the business model canvas by myself, but I, won't, I wasn't able to do it. And I managed to convince him to record the session. So I got the business model canvas of the developers and put it in front of him. And his first reaction, he looked down at the business model canvas, he looked at me, he looked down again, he just was red in anger, saying, what is this? We spent two days working, and this is what you've got? Tell me why I shouldn't fire you. Say, hey, just relax. I've been a little bit under the blue, just bear with me. Let me, just tell me why I'm, why, why I'm mistaken here. So we went over it. It was a bit of tension, but, well, could manage. It was not my work anyways. So, so I finished with that, and I went to the development teams. And I did the same. OK, guys, uh, I think I have your software just in my mind. Let's review it. And they saw it, the business model canvas of the CEO. So I also recorded the session, and I went over it. And you could see the faces of the people, like saying, who is this guy? And then they knew me. We've been working in the past. And, Man, what happened to you? You just changed. You used to be kind of smart, and now you bring us with this. So what's, what's all this about? So anyways, we went over with a small canvas, had the recordings, I went, off I went. Uh, my partner got a couple of phone calls from this company, just saying that we're not sure about the project anymore. My, <laughs> my partner didn't know what I was doing, so when he found out, he was like, Man, no, this is not the way to do it. So it's the only way I thought about it. So, so what I did was get a six-pack to a friend of mine, and just have the video edited. And I, I put some scenes from the CEO, some scenes from development, so I got put in there. And I, I just uh, set up a meeting with CEO, with developers, and I invited the rest, the rest of the company. And surprisingly, everybody showed up. Not only the CEO and developers, but also marketeers, uh, business intelligence people, everybody. There was not a lot of people, but it was Interesting. So I put on the video, and the first thing that showed up was the business model canvas of the developers. And the CEO just stood up and said, OK, this is enough. I did this with you twice, and now you're putting this over again. Are you a stupid monkey? So I just said, hang on, play the video, and then you saw how developers were explaining why of what we were seeing. So the CEO started stared at the developers, say, hey, is this yours? And the developers were like, yeah. So we did the same, but the other way around. So the CEO was saying something about uh, the business, and developers were saying, this is not right. Who in the hell says this about the business? I paused the video again. I said, you know, Paul, your CEO is saying this about the business, but eh, he's the CEO. Who cares? So the tension started to go up and up and up and up, but only at the beginning. The good thing is that they started to see that what others were saying was not totally incorrect. And let me show you a bit of an example of what was happening here. OK, so this is a filled-in business model canvas. It's not exactly what the CEO put there. But basically, the, the business uh, of an insurance company have insurance plans that they say to retail customers through call, cent call centers and personal assistance. And well, basically, they, uh, the key activities are the call centers to gather the uh, customers, they invoice customers, they spend money in IT, and they also have uh, financial assets backed up from a bank, 
and the partners are investors, uh, regulatory agencies, some technology vendors, and reselling partners. And you can see here down the cost. Well, you have operational expenses, the channels, cost, and whenever you call the insurance company, say, have an accident, and they pay you, well, that's also a cost. And on the other hand, you have the fee income of the insurance plans and the interest income. Well, pretty easy. OK, let's go and see what developers thought about this. OK, remember that this was the representation of the software. OK? So what are we selling? We're selling a call center tracking system, a campaign management staff, and a third-party integration API. No insurance policies here, no insurance plans, but we're an insurance company. Kind of weird. To who are we selling this stuff to? Oh, to users. You know, users. Uh, we also are selling this stuff to call center agents. Oh, but we don't get paid for anything. But we are selling to these guys. We are also selling to business intelligence department. I ask, well, what, what's this? Yeah, they have some Excel files. We, we do some tools to process them. And well, it's this guy that's there in the room in the back that is the only one that uses Excel here. He's in business intelligence department. So, OK. And we don't have key partners apart from some technology vendors. Oracle was one of them here. And, well, basically, we have IT operations, IT infrastructure, and IT expenses. Well, this doesn't look like a business plan, right? Or this is a business model. So let's, let's see them together. Well, as you can see, oh, yellow is for CEO, blue is for developers. Only insurance plans appear here. CEO was not aware of all this stuff. This IT operations for developers is not the same IT operations for CEOs. The CEO said, oh, this is the computers and my phone. Developers said, this is for AWS. Also, developers didn't care about regulatory agencies. They didn't care about these technology, technology vendors. Again, they are not the same. The technology vendors of the CEO was, for example, Google Analytics. We, they have to pay for it. Although developers integrate all the systems with Google Analytics, they were not aware that no, they were different. And if you can see here, costs and revenue only visible for business. So it didn't go so bad. So how things started to change when they started talking with this in front? Well, they come down a little bit. And uh, they went for this first example. So if you remember here, we're going to focus on these reselling parties. OK, in an insurance company, a reselling part, part, <coughs> party is a company that just recommends our insurance plans. And they have a cut of the price. So it's, well, let's say that it's a key partner, because it, it brings traffic to our site. So this company started to set up IT infrastructure and start building a third-party uh, API to be able to give data to these, uh, to these reseller parties. And all this generated this IT expense down here. And that's OK. But what uh, developers didn't know is that the cost of acquisition of new customers was exceeding the, sorry, the cost of acquisition was, was ex exceeding the, um, the revenue. So they were losing money. So the CEO said, oh, so that's why each month I get the numbers and they don't match. It's not me just expensing with my credit card. It's developers developing for free to these guys. And this happened because these guys send an email to our developers and say, hey, can you change this stuff? Yeah, of course, it's an hour. Yeah, of course. But if you remember, this third-party integration API is not part of the value proposition of the core of our company. So a marketeer that was there in the room 
said, okay, why don't we promote this to a value proposition? So the CEO was like, hey, no, we're not going to this. We are not a software development company. We're an insurance company. And then the marketeer said, yeah, what if we reduce the cuts for these reseller parties per sale, and we give them a flat fee plus, uh, plus a variable part if they pay us a fee for this integration API? So they can have all our data if they want to use it for whatever purposes they have. And they said, well, oh, it's nice. So, hey, now we have a new customer segment here. We are doing something new for someone new. The good news, this was already happening. Cost zero. So the CFO said, hey, API fees. And they started to do the show. They talked to the reselling parties. And they were like, oh, we, we, we were not aware that our developers were talking to your developers. Oh, they are not supposed to do that. Because we have contracts to do it. So basically, they were happy. The CEO in this company was happy. CFO was super happy. And well, uh, with these kind of examples, the, conversation, uh, the tension in the conversation started to go down and down and down. So we have another example. And this is only feed by developers. So we had this marketeer guy that went to his friend, Paul the developer, said, hey, Paul, you know about computers. Would you be able to develop, just in a couple of hours, a tracking system for the call center agents? Because I want to know how, they, how much time they spend per call, blah, blah, blah. And our vendor, call center vendor, is not giving us the, us the data. So Paul said, yeah, I can do it for you. So they want Paul to do it. And that's why Paul considered the call center agent and the business intelligence department part of the customers they were selling to. So during this meeting, the marketeer again said, OK, let's remove these call center agents and business intelligence people from here, and let's think about selling this stuff to companies in the group. Our, uh, our central company, just above us, is an insurance company. They for sure need something like this. So the marketer called a friend of his, do you need this? Yes, we have it. I want it. So the CFO again said, hey, licensing. And remember, we're an insurance company. But the cost of doing this, zero. It was already done. It was happening. Okay, so what happened here? The only thing that happened is that we set up a, a tool set to enable this conversation. And we had this framework that just made visible what, what was happening. So what, we need, or that what they figured out is that they needed to talk to each other. They, the developers realized that they needed to be aware of the business. They couldn't be just focusing on developing. And business saw that they need to help developers. Developers are not trained to speak business, are not trained to think in business terms. But it's possible. And with tools such as the Business Model Canvas, we can do that. And the good thing is that the Business Model Canvas and uh, DDD fits so well, because both focus on business value. And if you're a developer and your CTO goes to you and asks you, why are you doing this? And you say, because it delivers value, yeah, you make him happy. This is the thing. We need to sell stuff. Also, the business model canvas enables an ubiquitous language. And it does because you start talking to business in their terms. So you don't have to, th to, to pay attention on, am, they, am, I, am I naming this right? Just listen to them and try to just be relaxed with them and bear with them. But you have this core part of uh, DDD. And the most important thing is that you focus on the core. If it's not a value proposition, it's not important for business because it doesn't, come, it doesn't bring money to the business. 
And DD also focuses on the core. We need core domains. Okay? But we have more. And this is something I'm studying about. Domain discovery. So, as I said, here we have our core domains in the value propositions, or we should, because this is important for the business, and it shouldn't be important for uh, the software development. But also we have here generic and supporting domains. I'm still deciding if a uh, generic domain could be in a key partner, because you can outsource it. So let me talk about a small example here. Invoicing, typical example about generic domain. So this is how we had it in this company. We had a key activity that was invoicing with a cost for invoicing. So the CEO said, OK, we want to just outsource invoicing. We don't want to take care about it anymore. Uh, we'll reduce this cost. And the developer said, hey, but we want to go fully online. If we do this, we, m we might not have control about the invoicing system. So what if we think about invoicing as a value proposition? So again, marketeers saying, hey, I can charge for invoicing. So if you want advanced invoicing, you can pay for it. An extra euro, in this case, per policy. No one is going to notice. They're going to pay. They're going to have access to their, their invoices. So basically, here, we are talking about business. But this invoicing could be perfectly bounded contacts in, in the domain. And we are moving it to core domain, to a supporting domain, to generic domain. And we deliver this value through an app. What else can you use the business model canvas for? You can uh, use it to keep business in the loop. So if developers use this tool to just figure things out, you can have this alignment check. If business and development just diverge, they can sit around their business model canvas and check if their value propositions are the same. If they are not the same, something went wrong. And also, you can say, we decided to outsource this. We are going to inform only. So it's only giving information to, to the business people. But also, and most important, you can keep developers in the loop. Again, you can have the value proposition as an alignment check. But if you expose cost and revenue to developers, you can give them more tools to make decisions about where they are coding. So I, in, in this company, what we did was treat business as a different company, and we issued estimates. Not time estimates, monetary estimates. So most of the times, business came with a proposal for a feature. We gave back the estimate and said, really? This is not worth it. We only want to change a green button that floats around. Other times, say, we want this feature, and the estimate is really, really low. Quick win. Let's do it. And the good thing is that when you ask a developer to estimate in time, it's very easy to say, ah, well, three days, four, doesn't matter. If you tell them, if your salary would go with this, would you be saying the same? Oh, no, no, no. I would say, let's say that $300,000 for doing this. So in my experience, exposing this cost and revenue gave a lot of power to developers to be able to make better decisions. And finally, this is a question I, I heard yesterday in um, Eric Evans' workshop. Where do we put important stuff? How do we know if we have to get, give priority to stuff we are doing? How do we make people acknowledge that their bounded context they're working on, it's important or, no, or not? OK, if it's here, it's important. It's not here, just you're not going to get priority. Just as easy as that. The good thing is that things can change around here, so you might get your priority after all. And just to finish, I, I would like to have a thought about how we treat business people or business language. 
usually what we do is try to tell business people to comply to a language that we are defining. And we, are, we maybe have good intentions, and we are defining a language that sounds business-ish, but we are probably wrong. So, for me, understanding the, the terms that businesses are using and trying to use them ourselves works much, much better than trying them to change them. Because probably they will, they will say, yeah, I understand everything. And inside they're saying, I don't have a clue what they are talking about. So, thank you very much for coming. Uh, bit about me. I recommend you to read the Business Model Generation book. Super cool. <coughs> Just a different kind of book. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Uh, I think we have a couple uh, minutes for questions, if anybody has a question for Javier. So I like the idea of um, estimates in monetary terms. Mm -hmm. Were those um, like operational estimates for how much it was going to cost to operate once it was built, or just about the building? Well, it was, let's say that we applied a very generic policy about estimate. So with one team, we just calculated the, the cost of uh, human resources. And we used that, and we didn't think about anything else. But that, that was enough just to, to triage the features that were coming. But there were, then we found out that we had other features that apparently they had a low cost of implementation, but a high cost of maintenance. So then we started just elaborating a bit more. But the, the idea behind this was not to have real accurate estimations. We, we were not working yeah, with budget. So it, it, let's say that we tried something that worked and we didn't invest much more in that. Anybody else? All right. Well, Javier, thank you so much for teaching us about the business model canvas. Mm -hmm. It's a really awesome tool. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.